The team has three objectives for today's webinar. One, we will review recent updates for Eduphoria. Two, we will explore multi-test analysis, which is a new feature coming in spring of 2024. And three, we will identify how to evaluate student progress using multi-test analysis. All right, Jeremy, take it away. Thank you very much, Armando. Um, to get us started, we always like to uh, get a little engagement in our chat. So I want to just ask the question and get your answer, either A, B, C, or D. Winter break is just around the corner. What are you looking forward to most? Is it A, a fun vacation? B, a holiday tradition? C, visiting family? D, all the food? Oh, someone said sleep. I can't believe I missed sleep. Sleep should have been in here. <laughs> Uh, lots of ABCDs, uh, C, C, D, B, and sleep. Yeah, I apologize for missing sleep, folks. That was that was my bad. Good. Uh, I think most of you actually responded. I think we're all kind of excited about winter break coming. So, all right, let's dive in. Quick note as we dive into, especially the multi-test analysis part of this, is that all content covered on multi-test analysis is subject to change. We're still in the development process for any of this. So anything I show you in terms of like screenshots or anything I might preview in, in sort of a live demo here in a little bit, keep in mind that any of this is subject to change, whether it's you know the font that's used, a button in a particular place, or even an entire feature set, just keep in mind it's all subject to change as we go. But we're aiming at something really, really close to what you're about to see. All right, so I have an opening activity to get us kind of in the right mind frame. Sometimes we encounter problems that aren't immediately answerable. There are steps that we have to take before we can begin to actually solve the problem. This is an example of one of those kinds of problems, and I'll read it real quickly to you. Don't worry, I'm not going to read every single slide, um, but this one I will. Uh, Victor is traveling to a log cabin for winter break. During his travels, he likes to see exactly how far he's gone in total. He started a travel log and wrote down all of his traveling for the first day of his trip. He flew from Dallas to Denver, from the Denver airport to his cabin. He walked around the, the cabin a little bit while unpacking, and then he took his afternoon walk. What is the first step Victor needs to take to know exactly how far he traveled today? And I promise, there's no actual math involved. I'm not going to ask you to do any addition. But I really want to know, before we even attempt to do the math, what do we need to do to find the correct answer? Oh, Brandy's already jumped in. Yep, Jennifer's got the answer. Tara's got the answer. Yep, I think we've hit it. We have to convert everything to the same measure, the same unit, the same metric. Lots of different words for basically the same thing. We have to do conversion. Well, that's actually the exact same problem that occurs when we try to compare assessments. Your students may take a local test, such as the star, the interim, the map, but each different combination of tests, test types, the data associated with those tests, we have to do this kind of thing to appropriately allow districts to actually look at performance across what we would like to call a common scale. It's similar to a common metric or, or doing a unit conversion like we were talking about with the previous example. Many people have to do this in their districts. A lot of you are in this webinar right now for your districts. By actually exporting data out of AWARE and moving into a third party like spreadsheet, like Excel or Google Sheets. So a lot of that work involves formulas and things like that. What we're trying to do is build a tool to help minimize some of that work to achieve some of the same goals. So when we look at this example, we have five different test types. Not a single one of them has a common metric across all of those test types. And so it's difficult to make legitimate comparisons on performance and progress across all tests, especially as you mix types. Even if we look at raw score, raw score is not included in every single one of these test types, such as MAP. We have something similar like RIT, but it's not, an, not an exact one-to-one -one equivalence. And even with raw score, um, and even percent score, sometimes different performances on different tests require different sets of expectations due to the rigor of the assessment. So let's keep diving in. How do you currently compare performance across your assessments in your district? Do you A, export the data into spreadsheets and create your own scales? B, transfer the data into a third-party program and work from there? 
C, assume the scales are similar enough to make a comparison. Or D, we don't currently compare different types of assessments. Drop your answer in the chat. Some A's and some C's coming in. A mix of A and C. And David, you said just guessing, but joking. But I, I think there are some instances where people are doing it. Um, even in districts where best practices are really, really embraced and there are good solid conversions coming in, um, sometimes it's it's kind of best guess, right? Good. Some more A's and C's coming in. Okay. <laughs> My apologies, folks. A little bit of a cough. I'll try to mute next time. All right. Common scales are probably the biggest challenge for comparing assessment performance across different test types. Often finding what those commonalities are can be a different level of challenge, aside from just trying to get all the data in one place. Sadly, Edgephoria can't come up with the for the scales for you or with the scales for you, but we can allow you to use the scales that you come up with in a far easier way than it would take to do something like that in something like a spreadsheet. And I'll show you how that'll work here in just a minute. When looking at common scales, we have to ask ourselves, what does that RIT score mean in terms of a percent score? Or again, in terms of a performance level, or how does a tell pass result in one of these skills actually compare to any of those other scales? These are important questions to ask, and multi-test analysis will hopefully help you make the connections to do that. When implementing multi-test analysis, it's going to require a unified approach across your district with as many stakeholders as possible and aligning everything from protocols to how do we share rights, how do we manage sharing. All of these are functions I'll talk about a little bit more, but yes, you're reading that correctly. Multi-test analysis will introduce two new user level rights so that you as a district will have complete control over who is building what we call progress profiles inside of multi-test analysis and who is sharing progress profiles with the entire district. Some example questions that you might consider when trying to align your ideologies and efforts in your district are here. How do we currently compare performance across varied assessment types? Does everyone in the district know what's happening? What all is involved? Are we drawing conclusions based on student progress or student performance? Those are two very different things and they mean different things across different test types. So asking yourself that reflection question will be really critical. How could we use the results to evaluate programs we've adopted? A decent example, maybe you've adopted some sort of math tutoring curriculum or some sort of uh, automated math tutoring software. You can use something like multi-test analysis in the long term to look at data both before and after the implementation of the resource and see, are the kids progressing as, ex as expected due to the adoption of that resource? How do we vet the sharing process of progress profiles? Who's going to have control? When should they share? Do they know when they should share? And then last but not least, which test types and assessments do we need to include and for what type of analysis are we doing it with? Things to keep in mind as you begin those conversations. So how is this different from other tools? It's important to identify the difference between achievement levels and performance levels for part of this conversation. Multi-test analysis uses something we're calling achievement levels to align assessment performance. So to kind of tell you a little bit about that, performance levels are specific to individual assessments. Achievement levels are specific to the progress profiles that you'll be making in multi-test analysis and are essentially the common scales that are applied to the test that you include in the progress profile. We've intentionally tried to use different terms here so to avoid some confusion that could result when you have discussions about these types of things, particularly when conversing across stakeholder groups such as district to principals and principals to a PLC group. Linked to this idea about achievement levels is naming your achievement levels appropriately. It's going to be a key factor of success when using progress profiles that we think about how we're actually naming the achievement levels. As a district, how do you actually define achievement level one? What word or phrase would you use to actually describe achievement level one? Because you probably don't want to keep it called achievement level one. Maybe it needs to be did not meet. I use that very cautiously because star performance level names might be what you want. But star performance names aren't going to necessarily strictly align in every case with every test across the progress profile. 
Remember, the point of the tool is not to look at progress to make some comparisons across assessments compared to just a test, although that will be a very key use for this. It's really to look at how are my students progressing over time and how can I align how those different tests look at that experience. Different things added to that. So that was a lot for that one bullet. I'll hit the others a little more quickly. MTA is different than other tools by building visuals that allow for easier analysis of performance across assessments over time. If you're a premium district and you've been using single test analysis, you're used to having some visuals now and they've probably made a really big impact on your practice. Multi-test analysis will continue that trend and let you do it for more than one test at a time using your common scales through achievement uh, levels. It's going to help you use predictive analytics to determine assessment validity. We're building in something we're calling the correlation um, the correlation report, which uses some pretty well-vetted statistics to look at correlation between the assessments you pick and maybe a summative assessment that you choose to basically decide how well, statistically speaking, are our assessments uh, performing when matched to that summative assessment we're interested in. And like I mentioned a minute ago, we're going to have rights-based creation and sharing only. We built multi-test analysis with the district level user in mind. Many of the tools we've built recently for Aware Premium have had the teacher at its heart. This one is very specifically intended to be for district level users. So keep that in mind as you begin thinking about implementation. Multi-test analysis is going to be the most accurate way to analyze student progress. Asterisk, assuming you are implementing common scales in a way that makes sense. Obviously, we can't take any kind of credit or blame if uh, achievement levels aren't aligned, right? So when we look at our performance data across varied assessment types aligned to common performance scales, we're looking at things that are district defined. We're looking at performance over time. So this will be a tool that we can pull in assessments from multiple years and set them side by side. We're going to have visuals to digest that analysis. We'll actually be able to assess local assessment validity compared to a third party summative, such as maybe MAP or even the STAR test. And we're going to have many, many filtering options for you to really narrow in your analysis and decide where are my trends starting to fall apart and how can I allocate resources to address that, that difference in performance. It's going to allow you to deeply analyze an entire program or assessment set to identify performance level trends across a district, a campus, teacher groups, or student groups as appropriate, and really even individual student groups or individual students. So what will multi-test analysis do? Just reviewing real fast, concisely what a little bit I've already talked about. You're going to have student performance tracking. We'll have multiple assessments that can be pulled into a progress profile to really look at that assessment performance over time. We're going to allow you to create a common metric to match assessment levels to achievement levels. An example, how our RIT scores align to star performance levels. We're going to use multi-test analysis as an assessment review, review tool. How well did our local assessments predict performance on something like the STAR? We'll be able to answer that question. How well have our historical data points and local assessments prepared students for something like the end of year assessments? And we're even going to get to really tack in on, and look at some of that rigor and validity of our assessments using this tool. And then finally, program evaluation. I mentioned this a second ago with using a math tut tutoring program as an example. How well are the curriculum resources that we're using to prepare students for STAR actually doing that? And are we seeing student growth across multiple years? This is, I think, going to be really key, especially at those district levels. With resource allocation, I might be able to see with my progress profile, our local assessments are actually doing the exact same thing that this third party set of assessments are already doing. They're telling us exactly how our students are going to perform. So maybe I don't need that other third party set of assessments, which can help you save potentially some funds and selfishly maybe redirect some funds towards Edgeforia for some of our other cool things. Had to plug that in. Sorry about that. All right. Let's take a deep dive and explore MTA, multi-test analysis. I'm going to show you a series of slides that will show you each of the four views that we have within multi-test analysis one at a time, including the configuration options. And then I'm gonna break off and show you a live version of one we have in one of our demo and test sites, one of our dev sites. So you can see some of the cool little minutia that happen that we've built in with multi-test analysis as well. 
So let's talk about getting started. Getting started in multi-test analysis is a relatively simple process. There are two main tasks for administrative users that have the appropriate multi-test analysis right. You have to ask yourself, do I want to create a progress profile or do I want to open an existing one? Users without the right are only going to be allowed to open a progress profile. But what does that look like? Let's say I'm the district data analyst for math or maybe all contents in your districts. I'm going to make a progress profile. Let's use that first example, the fifth grade math one in that list in that visual. This is a fifth grade math progress profile that includes as many, notice it says 20 assessments, as many fifth grade math assessments as I could get my hands on and, and put into here. And when I click the share button, people are going to see this in their list, but when they open it, they're only going to see data relevant to their campus or their rosters or their rights depending on what level that is. So even though as a district level user, I made it to include every scrap of data I could find district wide, when I hit that share button and other people click it, they're only going to see what they're allowed to see. Very similar functionality to current quick views if you share quick views using that functionality. But now they're getting to see it side by side with visuals and seeing some progress over time with common scales. You'll notice when you hop in, it's right under single test analysis when it is eventually available. And you're going to get to build that progress profile with a button that's not in this uh, actual uh, snapshot. It's right next to the multi-test name, similar to the author table where you get to create an assessment. And if you're the person that gets the right to actually build multi-test analysis progress profiles, you have the option of keeping them private. You don't have to publish them. So you can use them for things like, I need to build this thing and just have it ready for this report I need to do. Let's talk about some key vocabulary as we go down here. Achievement levels, I hit those pretty well a second ago. They're different than performance levels. Performance levels are about the individual tests. Achievement levels are about the common scales across tests. And when we talk about the achievement levels within a progress profile, you have the option of using as few as two achievement levels and as many as six. Six achievement levels is probably ringing a, a, a bell in some of y'all's minds as STAR recently changed their, their progress indicator, uh, their performance level indicator to have six levels, including lows and highs. So here's an opportunity for you to try to find ways to incorporate that across assessments that haven't already got that pre-built in. You can use within and when creating progress profiles, any combination of grade levels, any combination of content areas, be cautious with that. You don't want your underwater basket weaving paired with your math, right? Or maybe you do. You need to include, or you can include any type of the following test types. We're limiting it right now to these five test types, and we'll be looking over time at ways to potentially incorporate more. We wanted to get something out to you sooner rather than later. So these are the five we're starting with. Any of your local tests, your map tests, STAR, TELPASS, and interim. And then you get to build those custom achievement levels up to six. Here's where some of the magic really starts to happen. This is after you've selected your assessments, you've selected test types, now I have to start configuring my achievement levels. This screenshot only shows three achievement levels. We can assume we needed to scroll to the right if you had more than three, then you could configure levels four and five or however many. But you'll notice on the left, I've got my list of assessments. I've got a comparative selector. I'll describe the comparative selector in a second. I've got the test type that that test belongs to, and then I've got an option to choose a metric. Every single test will allow you to choose a metric that that test has available for it. A table I showed previously earlier in the slideshow, and I can bring it up later if we need to, but star test will let you use the performance level indicator, the raw score, the scale score, the percent score. Your local tests will let you use highest level achieved, if it's a, t a newer test, any older test won't have highest level achieved, so we've blocked it for older. But you can still use percent score or raw score, uh, even on older tests. Your uh, tell pass will allow you to do any of the uh, skill checks. And MAP will let you do RIT as well as the 
uh, projected proficiency and percentile if you wanted to, although percentile may not be the most reliable thing to try to include in this because percentile is more about how they ranked against each other rather than a percent correct. So there's something worth that's worth mentioning. And then you notice after you've chosen your metric, you get the opportunity to actually fill in or select those performance levels or enter those raw scores, similar to how you might do it when actually building a test and configuring it in the test key, kind of like performance levels. After you've done that, you'll land on the district summary. So this is the first of the four views. The district summary is a perfect starting point after actually going through the configuration process. You can, at a glance, see the general performance spread of an achievement level across each of these tests. In this particular example, I can see that the highest achievement level seems to be climbing over time. This may be a trend that needs to be investigated to see if there are schools or teachers that tend to learn, uh, lean into this trend more than others. From this view, I can also get a sense on how each test is performing numerically based on the achievement levels that I've set. And since this is the first view we're looking at together, it's worth pointing out again that achievement levels are different than performance levels. I may be using performance level names as my achievement levels, but achievement levels are common scales. Be cautious about drawing hard conclusions from this view alone. Like any data analysis process, deeper dives may be required, and I need to move into a campus view or even deeper to find trends that are more meaningful and more specific. Notice here at the top, there are selections that are grayed out. I cannot, from the district view, narrow this by a specific campus teacher or student group because changing the view to one of those groups is going to be where I need to narrow down on a campus. However, you'll notice not grayed out are some demographic filters that I can apply. I can go ahead and apply filters for grade levels, student identifiers such as 504, ethnicity, et cetera. So lots of options to kind of narrow this down and it will update the visual table for you in the numbers as you apply those filters. Now let's look at the school summary. Similar to the uh, district view, or sorry, uh, as we move into the school summary, we're actually introduced to uh, something new. Notice at the top, I've got a total row that's built into the header, and then I see individual campuses. As a district level user, that total row is really, really critical. That total row is actually what the visual, the graph is, is reflecting. If I want to get individual school numbers in the graph, I need to use my campus filters at the top to pick the campus or campuses that apply best for whatever grouping I would prefer. And so I click school, I see total row, I use my filters to isolate campuses and even individual student groups, and then I see those achievement levels broken down by school across all of those test types. Here, you'll also be able to click on the name of a test and open up a more detailed view about an individual test if you need. Next down is that teacher view. Perhaps in the campus view, I noticed a particular trend on a particular campus. When looking at the teacher view, I can look at all of the teachers together or use filtering to isolate particular teacher groups. Consider some of the things that might actually occur to create some of these performance fluctuations. Are there rostering differences, special education loads, things that, of that nature that could potentially skew data in particular ways? But after taking that into account, any skew that I see here can really start to pull out trends that I might need to address. Similar to the way the student view works, I'll show you that here in a second. Only teachers that are available according to district rights and settings and individual rosters are going to be visible here. If your district does not allow teacher summaries for other teachers, then other teachers won't appear here for teachers. But if they do, then they will appear. Teachers without rights to view other teacher summaries will be blocked out and they'll see their summary only. And in that particular scenario, the total row will actually not appear as well because they'd have the only the only row, and so they would be the total as well. Notice in this view again at the top, I can filter by campus, by teachers, and by groups again if necessary. Next is the student summary. We're almost to my absolute favorite view. When we land on the student summary, 
it's probably the most powerful in terms of determining actual progress over time. The bar graphs generate and show the spread of students across each achievement level by test. You get a clear indication pretty quickly how each assessment compares to one another. As a great example in this visual, you can see right off the bat that the third grade ELA test assessment has zero students in achievement level one. This is a key analysis point that allows me to actually ask myself some questions. Why are there no students at the bottom level on this test? Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? If I'm comparing against the STAR test that's also in this view, the STAR has very few students in the lowest achievement level as well, so maybe it is a good thing. Then that means maybe I need to look at the campus and benchmark tests that uh, or the released 2021 STAR and dig just a little bit deeper into any trends that I'm seeing. Perhaps in another tool, such as single test analysis, I might be able to dig into an individual test to pull even more insights out. If I see a particular test here that is flagged as like interesting to me and needs more investigation. Then also, if I were to actually share this, it would be available for teachers and principals to see, but only they would be able to uh, actually see data that is applied to their individual rights or rosters. And then here's an example of an individual student view where you've toggled on the top left to a more detailed view to see individual students in a list. When I look at this, it changes a little bit. I have students running down the left and I've cut off the graph at the top. The graph is actually still present up at the top. And then across the top in this table, I have the tests and I can see someone like Ava. If I look at her, I can see she's achievement level one, 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 then four, then five. Ava Acosta has something happening here. And I can clearly see and demonstrate that she is progressing over time. However, I might have another student that I'm looking at that may be fluctuating wildly or is decreasing. If I look at uh, Shanae Adams, 43432, that's a general downhill trend. It helps me as an individual uh, teacher or even administrator look at student trends and target students that I see particular trends over time because the common scales across these achievement levels have made it more apparent to me how these students are achieving with those common scales. Here's a hypothetical example of his achievement level setup. Again, questions to ask. What's the goal of this progress profile? What subjects, grade levels, test types am I going to include to meet the purpose of that goal? What metrics should I include? And then how are those metrics aligned? When I look at this example, I've got the STAR test from 2015 in here. Granted, that's old, it's just part of our demo site. I'm gonna use the performance level indicator here because I've only got four achievement levels and I'm gonna map it to did not meet approaches, meets, and masters. Then on that district benchmark for fourth grade RLA or ELA, I'm going to use percent score. When I select percent score, it populates automatically something over 100 because 100 is the max I could have on a percent score, right? And then I get to put in the numbers for did not meet if I type in a zero because any kid that's that low all the way up to about 58% needs to be did not meet. So that's why I put 58 under approaches. And then any kid from 58 to 72 would fall into approaches. And so I put the 72 under meets and so on. And by the time I'm at master's, any kid that's 83 or above would be under the master's uh, or fourth achievement level. Then if I choose raw score in the next one, it will detect automatically what the max raw score is for that assessment and populate it as your denominator. And then I can use the numerator and input what numerator raw score I need to match to those achievement levels. And then finally, You'll notice this third grade ELA test, highest level achieved is chosen, but I have a red status indicator. The red status indicator is a warning to me that I have more performance levels than achievement levels in how I have set this up. So that means I am not going to be able to map every single performance level to an achievement level appropriately. So maybe I might want to change highest level achieved on that test to something numeric so that I can take and actually break it into four equal parts appropriately. Or maybe I want to go back in my configuration and select an additional achievement level so I can get that mapping. So something to keep in mind there, if you don't have a great matching on words to words with achievement levels and performance levels, then maybe something numeric might help you achieve that goal a little bit easier. And then, like I mentioned before, the selected test view, if I actually click the name of the test in the graph, then I get a much more focused in view of that particular test. 
with a list of kids and then some more details about that student and then the achievement level that was earned with whatever metric I chose that is matching to that. All right, last major feature to talk about this. I have it here as predictive analysis, but the report is called the correlation report. So in theory, we could call this a correlative analysis as well. But the goal here is for me to see at the district summary level. So the district summary level is the only level that this will actually work at. Remember when I was in the configuration earlier, I had a column to pick a test that was called a comparative test. If I have a summative test, such as a semester exam, a star test, or a map test, I can check that little toggle next to that test, and it will choose that one test to be my comparative. And yes, we're only going to allow one. In this scenario, I picked test three to be my comparative test. And so it's going to compare test three to every other test in here. Now, note as I move across, test one and test three, if I look at total students, it says 2,000. I'm not 100% sure if those numbers actually add up to 2,000. The important part is the total students for this just conversation is 2,000 kids took both assessments. So when I do the, the predictive analysis or I look at the correlation report, it's only taking into consideration the number of kids that took both assessments. It doesn't just compare all kids to all kids. So it's a little more valid in terms of statistical analysis. And then next to that, you'll see two columns, one for the correlation strength and the next for, we're calling it score, but we're going to change that name on that column to be a little better um, and match what's actually happening here. But the correlation score, you have three options. There is either no correlation, it was correlative, or it was highly correlative. Be cautious when looking at correlation because correlation is strictly how linear is the relationship between the two. If all of your data points line up in a nice, neat line, you're going to see a really great correlation. But that might mean that kids that performed high on test one also performed high on test three. But maybe those high performances, there's a big gap between them. Same thing with the kids that performed low on test one might have also performed low on test three, but the gap between that might be big. So that's why that score column is brought in, because even though you might correlate, maybe the average score of test one is higher than the average score of test three. Now, keep in mind, I say average score. We're not just doing a straight average. We're actually doing a weighted percent comparison. I can provide a lot more details about that later, but we'll probably do a different set, uh, webinar on the actual math involved with this at some later date. So it's really important to know, is the score higher, lower, or similar to when I see that? So a test that has really strong predictive validity is going to be correlative or highly correlative and have a similar score. Tests that are correlative but are way high or way low might not be correlative in a way that matters to me. Or if it's not correlative, the tests have really no great relationship and we'll still give you whether the score is higher or lower or similar just to give you that extra piece of information. All right, before I sum it up, I wanna highlight just a few really nifty things that multi-test analysis will do. If we jump in here to this ELAR sample that I did, I'm gonna open this here in a second. And those of you with really sharp eyes are going to note that the bars don't match the numbers. That is true for right now, because again, this is very, very much in the development side of things. And so what we did is we just populated this with some stuff. I'm going to use air quotes that you can't see me using stuff so that you could see this kind of in action with what we have finished so far. So just keep in mind, it won't match, but you'll get a general idea. So I'm going to open ELR, ELAR sample. I have right here the ability to toggle between the different views, this button set is already changing. Um, it's going to be more like uh, buttons I can toggle between just like quick views here. I've got my various filters for my groups. I have uh, more of them if I need them. And I can hide them. I can filter by groups of, of campuses, teachers, and as I hot hover over each of these bars, notice the percentages actually pop in. And my uh, pop-up toolbar shows me what the name of the test is, what achievement level I'm actually over, and what that percentage is with the ratio of that percentage, number of students over a total. And as I move it down from test to test, I can see those numbers changing. But 
like I was saying before, sometimes it's really important to see what the achievement level trends are, but that's kind of hard to compare one achievement level across tests when there's such variability. Like if I'm looking at achievement level three, for example, well, achievement level three is way on the left on some tests, way on the right on others. It's hard to tell if achievement level three is similar. So when I hover over achievement level three at the top, it will isolate achievement level three. Then I can click it and it will show me just achievement level three. I can unclick it, bring it all back, go to the next one, look at just achievement level two, and I can see a little easier how each of those achievement levels are comparing to each other. And then also worth highlighting down here at the bottom, right now it's showing me counts of kids by achievement levels. I can toggle this to a percent as well and do a percent if needed. All right, so that ends the quick live demo. Let's sum it up. And then I'll hand it back over to Armando and then we'll start addressing questions. I showed this slide just a little earlier. Multi-test analysis, pardon me. Sorry, that had a little bit of a coughing fit there. Uh, Multi-test analysis recap. We're looking at student performance tracking. We're loading in multiple assessments, pulling them in side by side in the progress profile, looking at performance over time. We're including a metric that it creates like a common scale so we can do these, uh, these uh, uh, comparisons in a valid way. It's going to help us review our assessments and answer, answer a question like how well are our local assessments actually predicting performance on STAR? How have our historical assessments actually prepared our students for that end of year assessment? Helping us look at things like rigor and validity. We're going to be able to use it as a program evaluation tool to help us with resource allocation and answer how well are our curriculum resources that we're using to prepare our students for start actually achieving that goal. Have we seen student growth across multiple years or not? All right. I know there's a lot of questions. I'll get to those here in just a second, but let me ask you guys one real fast. And let's drop it in the chat. After seeing some of these features, which part of multi-test analysis are you most excited about? Is it A, the ability to configure custom achievement levels? B, the various views to analyze progress? C, the graphs, the visuals? Or D, something else? And tell me what you think it is. You got some B, some Cs, B slash C, all of the above. B slash C again. All of it, cool. Everything, I like that. I like hearing that it makes me feel like we're building the right thing. We did reach out to several districts, so we didn't just make this blind. We were really aiming at a particular target, cool. Correlation reports, good. Excellent. Thank you all so much for uh, participating in that chat with both of the questions or all three of the questions I asked you guys. As a final thing, it's worth noting, this is an aware premium only feature. If you're not currently in a Wear Premium uh, district and this has piqued your interest and you think, oh, okay, now with single test analysis, with student mastery, with multi-test analysis, so I'm really seeing the value in premium, reach out to sales at edgeofforia.net if you'd like to trigger a conversation about that. And now I'm going to hand it over to Armando. Thank you, Jeremy. We do have a few questions. Uh, I was wondering if we can maybe look at those and then answer them. Absolutely. Uh, is uh, will drilling down to the student level to view the profile be available? Well, drilling down to the student level to view the profile. Oh, to view like the student profile. Correct. Um, that is something we have on our radar. If it's part of the first release, I can't say for sure. It's definitely something we would like to incorporate. It kind of depends on how tight we get on our release schedule, but it's definitely on the radar. Great. Thank you. There's also another one, the data that is attached to the teacher, is that the students that they currently have or who they tested? Um, it's going to behave uh, very similar to the where the students were part of the quick view, um, where if it's still current year, um, where they were and where they are should be pretty much the same unless you had really last minute schedule changes. Um, so think of it as the where they were view. Got it. Thank you. Uh, we have another one. Uh, when we share a view, can we make this view appear at the overview tab? That is not something we presently have. So that would actually be excellent feedback when multi-test mm -hmm. analysis gets released. Definitely. Great feedback. Um, a few more. <laughs> if uh, teachers have the rights to view grade level and subject area data, is that what will give them the ability to see teacher summary for other teachers? 
Uh, the short answer to your question is yes. The, the slightly longer answer to that is similar to how Quick Views has that top level toggle where I can click it and change my, my access to be like a class period or um, all my students or a special right that I've assigned that person. Maybe they're a department head or a curriculum coordinator or something. Um, you will get that same toggle in the progress profile after it's opened. And so once I open a particular progress profile, I can view it as the teacher or I can click the top drop down and change my rights. And that will change it to view it the way those rights would allow it to happen. Thank you. We have another question. When is this rolling out? Everyone wants to know when is this going to be available? Um, the answer to that is soon. <laughs> Eduphoria holds absolutely no rights or responsibilities to when soon is in the past, present or future. <laughs> so soon. All right. Thank you. Uh, to be to be fair and, and give you an actually honest answer, um, we're aiming at the spring semester. I can't say definitively, even if it's going to be early or late spring, but sometime before the 23, 24 school year is over. And the last one, um, how do I know if we are an aware premium district? I think um, the if, easy answer to that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Armando. Well, I think the easy answer to that is you should see single test analysis on the left-hand side of your screen. So Absolutely. in the navigation panel uh, on aware new nav, you should see STA or single test analysis. And uh, mastery. You, uh, yes, uh, and we'll mastery. Yep. All right, those are all the questions. Let me go ahead and start wrapping this up. Uh, we are glad that this webinar has been able to provide you with an update on uh, the new multi-test analysis tool. If you need additional assistance on this or for other topics, please email training at eduphoria.net. Jeremy, thank you so much for hosting. On behalf of today's team and all of Eduphoria, we would like to thank you for joining us on today's webinar about multi-test analysis. Have a great day.